contempt and glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Let me keep reading. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That is some wonderful, wonderful Christian instruction right there. My uh, Bible, this particular one I'm using to preach from this morning, at the beginning of the third chapter in bold letters above it, it says the true center of Christian life. And I, I believe we can say that this morning. There's a lot of things we're told here to mortify. We are commanded here to put off some things, to not do some things. But then also we are commanded to put on some things, to add some things to our life. We're told by the Lord to, uh, through the mouth of Paul, of course, uh, Jesus didn't say these things, they're not in red, but the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, inspired Paul to write them, and he wrote what God had bade him to write. So really God spoke these things to us, told us to mortify our members on the earth. To, to not be a fornicator, to not be unclean, to not have inordinate or misplaced or unusual affection, to not have evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. And he said there was a time in your life you had these things, but now you have put off all these things. You're changed from that. You're dead. He started out in verse number three. You're dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And then he begins to give more instruction. Not only is, and, and I believe you know this this morning, I think I preached it to you and taught it the best way I know how. It's not important only what we do not do. It's not important only what we abstain from. It is important what we put on. It's not all about the Christian life. It's not what I put off from me or the things I do not wear or the places I do not go or the places that I do not attend, or the things I do not say, but we are given instruction here in the book of Colossians that Paul is writing to this church, and he tells them that it's not just putting everything off. There is some other things that you're supposed to put on. We're not just supposed to strip everything out of us. We're supposed to add to some things. And he said that we, we want to get rid of all of our wrath and all of our anger and all of our malice and all of our blasphemy, all of our filthy communication. We don't want to lie to one another. We don't want any of these things going on in our life. Seeing that we have put off the old man with his deeds. But now in verse number 10, he gives us instruction. He said to put on the new man. Want to add some things. He's being renewed. I read on and I, I read several things here. And I'm, going to, I'm just skimming down through it. Then I'm going to get where I want to preach. Put on these things. Add some things to you. And he said we want you to put on bowels of mercy. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. Meekness. Long suffering. I want you to forbear one another. I also want you to forgive one another. If you're in a quarrel with somebody. You need to forgive them. Don't just hold a grudge. Don't have a crusade or a feud. Let it go. And let the 
peace of God rule in your heart and to which you're called in one body and be you thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. God doesn't just want to strip us down from everything. He wants to clothe us with some things as well. In verse number two, as he begins this place of, of uh, Christian sinner, the sinner of Christian life that's called here in my Bible, he said, set your affection on things above and not on things in the earth. I want to try to preach for just a very few minutes if I can this morning on setting the direction of affection. Affection is something that comes naturally to a human heart. Affection is something that every one of you have. I heard people say, I'm not very affectionate or I'm not this, I'm not that. Everyone has some type of affection that comes natural to them. Affection means to like, to care for, to desire something, to be attached to something or to someone. I have affection to my wife. I have affection to my children. I have affection to the church people here. But it is also something as, as natural as it is to have affection. The nature of affection by man, just man by his nature, is his affection is turned inward. Most of us care the most about ourselves. Now, I know probably in some times in our life, our piety tells us we don't care about ourselves. We just care about everybody else. But the truth springs forth in all of our lives that number one is us. We typically take care of ourselves the most. One of the last day signs that was given in the scripture with Paul again writing, he said that men would be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They put everything ahead of God. I listened to a colored lady preach the other night, and uh, I told Jennifer, I said, well, if I had her phone number, get a hold of that woman, I'd have her come preach us a revival. I'm telling you, some of the stoutest, holiest preaching I've ever heard in my life. A Jamaican woman, a black Jamaican woman, and uh, a powerful, I mean, holiness woman. Matter of fact, said, uh, uh, one of the brother told me the other day that at the convention where it was, she said something to him about her dresses touched the floor. She didn't show any of her leg. She said, my sleeves go to my wrist, and my dress neck comes above my collarbone. She said, if your wife don't look like that, she's not holding a son. Praise God. I'm telling you, that woman, because she was an old-time holiness sister, and she began to preach about men being lovers of themselves more than lovers of God, and we see that every day. She said people would sit down and watch a four-hour ball game and shout and holler and scream and sit on an old cold bleacher or a hot bleacher without even having a back on it. They don't think anything about it. And if the holiness preacher preaches over 25 or 30 minutes, we feel like he's invaded our space somehow. She said people can sit down and watch movies that last for hours and then sit down and involve themselves in anything the world has to offer. And they don't have any problem with that at all when it comes to the house of God. And if it lasts over two hours, you're in my time. If the preacher preaches over 30 minutes, you're in my time. I'll tell you what it boils down to this morning. Men are lovers of their own self more than they are lovers of God. It is not. It is not in the nature of man to seek God. It is not in the nature of man to serve God. It is in the nature of man to care only about himself. The affection in the heart of a man must be set. Our Adamic nature impedes us from having the proper directions to our affections. Adam and Eve were the first created humans. They were the original cast. They're the prototype, the first man, the Bible called him, the first woman. Even before they sinned, even before God came in the garden and said, Adam, where art thou? Even before that fruit had been eaten from the tree, we already find the direction of affection in Adam and Eve was all horizontal. It was what we want, what's best for us. What's pleasant to my eye? It's the fruit I want to eat. It's what I think I want to do. It's where I want to go. The very first man and woman were not affectionate towards God first. They were affectionate first to themselves. How do you know? Because the very first thing they did when God turned them loose in the garden, He opened the gate and let them out of a stop trailer, as it were, and they went about doing what they wanted. They said, I want to eat that, I'll eat that. I want to eat this, I'll eat this. And they had no regard. I want you to understand this morning that the affections that lay in your heart have to be
be set. Just like I set the temperature for church. Just like I set things in life. Just like I set the schedule for my day. Just like we have a set schedule for a church service unless the Holy Ghost moves. The affection in the heart of men has to be set because by nature, all of your affection is horizontal. But affection is supposed to be vertical. He said, set your affection on things above. That's vertical. Not on things of the earth. We live our lives for ourselves. We serve ourselves and we worry only about ourselves and not what God wants, not what He desires out of our life. We're skewed in our affections. We're born out of joint, as it were, by nature. We're born out of sync with God, as it were. We're born warped. We're born set wrong from Genesis. All the way from Genesis, we find man being set to do wrong. It is fully set in the hearts of the sons of men, therefore to do evil, the Bible said. I'm telling you, man, you know, you don't have to teach a child how to do wrong, do you? Did anybody have to teach you how to do it? Mine never did. All three of mine, as cute and cuddly as they were, it didn't take them long to sniff it out and throw a fit. They couldn't even talk. They didn't have a tooth in their head. They couldn't walk. They couldn't feed themselves. But buddy, they learned how to throw a fit in a hurry. In just a matter of a few days, sometimes even hours after birth, that child will stiffen out when it doesn't get its way. You see a little baby sitting in a carrier and those legs go rigid and the head goes back and they wow! They throw a fit because they're not getting their way. I'm telling you, it's bound in a child. The Bible said foolishness is bound in the heart of a child in the rod of correction. In other words, your daddy's belt drives it out of you. What are you preaching to us this morning? I'm telling you, as children of God, no, we have to work on ourselves like we work on our children because by nature we don't do it right. One of the first words a child learns. I maybe mentioned this even recently. When ours was little, I worked on them all the time. Da da, da da. And every time she had them, she'd say, "Mum, mum, mum, mum." And I'd get them back, and I'd say, "Da da da da." And Papa would get them, and he'd say, "Say, pa, 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 pa. And they just make some unintelligible goo. And the whole family melts. Oh, his first word was daddy. A little old child laying in his crib. Don't even know what's going on. He goes, mama, mama. Oh, his first word was mama. Didn't you hear it? And we go grab the baby book and start writing it down. On a certain, certain days, the very first word was mama. I'll tell you what ours was. Our very first words out of most of ours is mine. My bottle. My pacifier. My toy. I'm telling you, by nature, man's affection is set wrong. It has to be set. Paul tells this church here, you set your affection. You set it. You work on it. You do what needs to be done to it. Jeremiah 17 and 9 tells us that the heart, you know, some people say, I'll follow your heart. I heard somebody just not just very recently. I heard an individual tell a young person, just follow your heart, sweetie. Just follow your heart. And I thought to myself, you couldn't give them any worse advice. The Bible said the heart is deceitful above everything else. And it's desperately wicked. And who can know it? You don't just follow your heart. That's ridiculous advice. You don't tell a young person, just follow your heart. Whatever you want to do, you just do it. Just do whatever makes you happy, sweetheart. No. Set your affection on things above. Get a hold of your affections and set them on God. Following your heart will lead you to disaster. Yes, it will. Following your heart will put you in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you have a broken bone, you go to the doctor. They don't just x-ray it. It's okay, your arm's broke. Hold your arm out and you just hold it out next. Put a bu bunch of plaster on it. Stick it in the cast and you walk around for, and you get that out. If they don't set that, you're going to have a crook in your arm. Brother Alvin Sheffield, it's, uh, it's Damon, Brother David Burnett's grandfather, his mother's dad. Isn't that right? Sister Jeanette, him and her dad. And, uh, and Sister Kay Futrell's dad. Brother Alvin Sheffield was doing some work. Brother Thurl Futrell told me about. He's doing some work and zoom, he went over his thumb with a skill saw and cut his thumb off. He grabbed the other part of that thumb instead of going to the doctor. He said, call my son-in-law Thurl. So they called Brother T.L. Future went out and, and uh, got out there to Brother Alvin and Sister Wilma's house and got that 
piece of a thumb and he put it on the other one and he splinted it and he set it, Sister Gail, and he wrapped it all up. Brother Alvin said, you can do it, we'll pray over it and just set it, we'll do it right. And then when everything was said and done, they took that off after it healed. Instead of his thumbnail like this, his thumbnail's cocked around to the side. <laughs> Brother Thurl put that thumb on crooked and it grew back together crooked. And so Brother Alvin's finger never was right because it was not set right. I'm telling you the reason some of us keep having trouble in our Christian walk is because we're not set right. I'm telling you, you've got to get yourself in line with God's Word and get yourself in line with what God wants and take control of yourself and set your affection. Don't just leave it any old way. You know, he says here, well, it's, uh, look here, it's a painful process to set things. I've had broke bones set. It's not pleasant. Sometimes it almost hurts as bad as the break did. You ever had a broke bone? Anybody? You ever had to have one set? It hurts to set it. It sometimes hurts to set your affection on things above. Sometimes it's painful to set your affection on heavenly things instead of on things on the earth. But it's a must if we intend to walk with God. And the, the Sister Jean already mentioned this this morning. And, and, and me and Sister Jean don't chat back and forth all week and compare our notes. We don't talk about it. I, I, I only talk to Sister Jean on the phone if I'm calling to see, you know, if we're dismissing service for something or if she's sick, we're going to see if she's going to be there to teach Sunday school or whatever. We don't chat all week long. But right here on my notes, Sister Jean, and Blue ink, where everything else was in black, in blue ink and underlined in red, I wrote this. The word if is a powerful part of the Christian walk. And Paul said, if you be risen with Christ. Yes. If you want to walk with God. Sister Jean's Sunday school lesson this morning started with four ifs. And now I'm down to just one if right here. If you, if you be risen with Christ. Colossians 3 and 1 starts out, if you be risen with Christ. If you are, then you must. If you are risen with Christ, you must set your affection. Notice, he doesn't say here, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And pray the Father in the name of the Son that he might set your affections on things above and not on things in the earth. It's not what it says. Is it? It don't sound too far off. It almost sounds kind of King James Version-y, don't it? It does not say in verse 2, Pray ye therefore unto the Lord of the harvest that he will set your affection on things above. No. It doesn't say it set your affection on things above and if you have any trouble with this, beg everybody else to help you. It doesn't say that. It said set your affection. You said it. Paul said, if you're risen with Christ, then you set your affection. I want you to get a hold of that. If you are, then you must. If you are risen with Christ, then you must set your affection. Don't plan on the preacher, on God, on the Holy Ghost, on your parents setting it for you. You set it. You do it. Many things about our directions and our affections are not God's responsibility. Proper affection is always sent in an upward motion towards God. The act of following and allowing an unbridled affection to continue in our lives will always end us in a spiritual disaster. And we'll be off course and shipwreck. The work of the flesh, vices, sins that are committable by humanity, all of those are results of an unset affection. You can get in your car, you can drive from right here all the way to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And your radio station can be on hard rock all the way there. And all the way to Milwaukee, you can cry and pray, God, please turn that over to enlighten. God, please put that on the gospel station. Please don't let them play the, uh, the nine-inch nails on there. God, please don't let them play the Beatles. Please don't let them play Pink Floyd, Lord. You know I don't need to hear that. Change my radio station. And I want you to know when you get to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, if that's the way you approach it, you're going to get there and your radio is still going to be playing hard rock. Because God's not going to change your station for you. You're going to have to take your finger. Everybody got one? You got a finger ready? You're going to take your finger and you're going to have to reach over there and set that to what you want it to play. If it's playing the wrong thing, set it. If all you ever get is static on your spiritual shortwave radio, set your channel right. You know the reason some people don't ever do any better spiritually than they do? It's because all they hear is... Because they're not set. Set your affection. People say, well, I had a woman one time told me, she said, I still wear britches 
and I've been saved over 20 years because God's never dealt with me about it. I said, ma'am, the Bible said, let not a woman wear that that pertaineth unto a man. She said, well, I just don't read that verse in the Bible, and that way I'm not held accountable for it. I said, I hope that you take that. If you go all the way to judgment with that, I hope I'm standing by you when the Lord judges you. Because when he tells you you can't go to heaven doing those things, I'm going to look around and say, I told you so. I'm telling you, you can't just say, well, I'm not reading that. That way I'm not accountable for it. You've got to set your affection. You're some mud hole in the front door where you got to walk out every day. You can weep and cry and bawl and squall. You can call every preacher in the country and ask them to fast and pray for God to dry the mud hole up or part the water like you did in the Red Sea. But you know what God expects you to do? Walk around the goofy thing. You can traipse through that mud hole and come to church with mud all up your britches leg or your dress tail and say, Brother Justin, y'all are going to have to pray that God dries up that mud hole. Quit walking in it. Hello? Yeah. We're walking in it. Ain't nobody doing it for you. My grandfather was a smoker. When he got saved, he began to set his affection. That desire didn't leave him that night. And so, Brother Bill Banks went to work, told Elijah Hartwell that he was working for us. He said, Elijah, I got to work on this. I know I'm not supposed to be a Christian and smoke cigarettes. And so, you know what he done? Brother Hartwood or Brother O'Mine or one of them got him a little New Testament and he took it in the pocket of his overalls where he kept his cigarettes and he said every time he, he reads for a cigarette, he pulled that Bible out and read a verse and put it back. And he got one another cigarette and read to pull that Bible out and read another verse. But you know he said in time, it got where I didn't even want to reach up there anymore because the devil didn't want me reading the Bible. You know what Grandpa did? He said his affection. Don't just sit around and say, well, I can, I can, I can. I can't do this, I can't do that. I'm telling you, if you've got a cell phone, you can use it right, or you can use it wrong, go to hell over it. You can come to church late. I, I've seen young people, and listen to me. I've seen young folks bring their cell phones to church, lay them on the altar, and ask the preacher to anoint and pray over it because they couldn't quit looking at pornography. Well, it's not the phone's fault. It's the kid's fault. Pray over you. Not the phone. I said, a youth camp one night, camp meeting, whatever it was, young man was praying, had his hands up, all he's sincere, he's praying, praying, praying. All of a sudden, I saw him reaching for his back pocket, and I knew what he was going to do. He jerked his cell phone out and just chunked it on the floor and shattered it to bits. Went on praying. A few minutes, his dad walked by, and I said, hey, I just want you to know that cell phone is in bits over there. Somebody picked it up and put it in that wastebasket. He said, what happened? I told him. He said, why didn't you stop him? I said, it wasn't my place to stop him. Hey, he said, I'm paying for that phone. <laughs> Dad went and dug it out of the trash can. You know what I told the boy when church was over? I said, won't you just quit doing dirty stuff on it and do it right? He said, I, it just, it's just like every time I pick it up, there's just something dirty on it. I said, ain't nothing dirty on there unless you've done it. Come on here now. You go to the motel room and come back to church and cry and bawl and squall because that television was on a dirty channel the whole time using rants and all weekend long. There's an off button on the remote. There's also a power plug button over there in the wall. You can unplug it. Set your affections. If you're having trouble with something, work on it yourself. Don't just sit there and expect God to do everything for you. You know, if you say, well, I want y'all to pray for me. All my friends, every time I go out, my friends, they keep going to bad places and they I, and they go to drug and play. They go down there and they're doing drugs and they're doing this and they're doing that. I wish you'd pray about it. I wish you'd pray God to make them quit doing that. Why don't you quit going with them? Amen. Amen. Set your affections. There's a whole lot of things that we bother God with and the church with and folks with. And the truth of the matter is you can fix it yourself if you just would. Just stop doing it. One young man told me, said, he's going to get rid of his cell phone because he said, I just can't keep from calling that center girl I met at that party. I just can't keep calling her. I said, you mean to tell me that you're just walking down the road, your phone's up here in your pocket, and all of a sudden, it rings. And you look at it, and it's just dialing her number. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're up here like this, saying, hello, honey, bunches. And you're in a big conversation, lewd conversation with some ungodly girl. 
He said, well, it's not exactly like that. I said, no, it's not. You push the green call button. You put her number in. You push call, and you got her on the phone. Don't blame the cell phone for it. Set your affection. A preacher told me, and a family daughter one night, my wife had stopped to get some things on the way to preach. And this preacher stopped me. And he said, I want to ask, he's a pastor, pretty well known. Everybody in this building knows him very well. He said, Brother Richardson, I'd like to ask your opinion about something. I said, well, I've got one to give, I'm sure. He said, we passed the wastebasket at the altar around and took up all the cell phones from our young people because they wouldn't quit sending dirty pictures of themselves to one another. And he said, do you know we took their cell phones up? And we caught a young man and woman in the back seat of a car right on the campground just a little while back, and they was committing a terrible act. He said, what kind of advice can you give? I said, forget them cell phones. Get those young people in the order and get them saved. You hear me? He said, now, brother, we're talking about a good Christian girl. She wears her hair up. I said, I don't care if she has one bun, three buns, a ponytail, or a braid. If you're fornicating in the back seat of a car, you're not saved. Amen. I don't care what your name is or whose church you go to, you're not saved. Amen. He said, well, now, brother, so-and-so's phone was made by Pastor so-and-so, and he picked it up, and there's a picture on there of a naked young lady. I said, that picture didn't put itself on there. There was somebody done that. Are you hearing me this morning? Set your affection. Oh, Quit blaming God. God for your trouble. Quit blaming yes. everybody else for your trouble. If you're struggling with something and you know you're not in line with God's word and you don't feel the blessing of the Lord, get a hold of it and set it. Amen. Set it yourself. Don't try to walk through life wanting God to dry up your mud holes and change your radio station and make your phone quit calling that other woman. For heaven's sakes, Set your affection. How do you do it? Set it on things above. Yeah. Praise God. I'm getting ready to close. One man told us. He said, every time I go through a certain line at a certain checkout in the store, this woman flirts with me. Every time I go through there, she flirts with me. He said, it's sight in this world. I wish the Lord, he said, I want, we ought to just pray that the Lord would make her get another job. <laughs> she worked at Walmart. I said, isn't there about 20 checkout lines in those Walmart? This is before self-checkouts, okay? It's before we all went to work for Walmart. Did you ever wonder when they're going to send you a W-2 since you're having to do the checkout work? And they get aggravated if we don't check it out just right. And I told Jennifer the other day, I said, they never trained me for this. I didn't have any on-the-job training. I said, isn't there about 20 lanes in y'all's Walmart? He said, yeah. And I said, what's wrong with the other 19 where she don't work? And he's kind of looked at me like I was dumb. Well, he said, if she just get another job, I said, I'd drive 20 miles down the road to another Walmart where I kept going through there and flirting with some woman who wasn't my wife. Don't go through her checkout line. Well, is that right or is it not? Right. Set your affections. If you're having trouble with something this morning, before you take up all God's time trying to get him to do it for you, find out is it something I can do for myself? Can I set my own affection? Can I do right by myself? There are things, and I understand that, there are things that man needs God to help him with. I know that. I know there are addictions, and I know there's things that people get themselves into, and they have to have the help of God. But I would say a large percentage of what we struggle with in our Christian walk are things that if we would just take the initiative, we could do better ourselves. Amen. Set your affection on things above. If you are then you must. Praise God. I've been there just like you have. And if you find yourself there this morning, don't take the tuck head and think Brother Justin's mad at me and God don't love me no more. I've been there too. When I was praying, Lord, would you do this? Lord, would you do this? Lord, would you do this? And I knew in my heart if I'd just do it myself, he wouldn't have to do nothing. You don't always have to get the supernatural world involved in your problems. There's things you can do for yourself. Amen. If you know a certain thing bothers you, don't mess with it. If you know you go in a certain store and God tempts you to do something, or the devil tempts you, you feel like you're being tempted to do something, and you're always praying, God, help me, God, help me, quit going in there. Years ago, a man told a certain preacher, said, I'll tell you every time I go in that store, certain store, on a street corner, I'll take you and show you right where it's at. He said, every time I go in there, I leave with a dirty magazine. And he said, I've prayed about that. Prayed about that. Well, that magazine didn't jump in his pocket. 
He bought it, Sister Carolyn. He paid for it himself. I said, told the man, I said, why didn't he just go to another gas station that didn't sell them? He said, why didn't he just not buy it? You know, when I got my driver's license, I went and got gas in that same station. I got gas in that station just a few weeks ago, matter of fact. And I've never bought one of those magazines. I've been in and out there and I've bought pops and I've bought waters and I've bought ices and candy bars and gas and all kind of stuff. And I have never left there and got to the car and thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. There's one of those filthy magazines in my hip pocket. How did that thing get in there? It didn't jump in on its own. Set your affections. Do it yourself. Set it. Young people, there's things they struggle with. I know that. Just set your affection. Instead of getting rid of your cell phone, one young man got rid of his phone. Couldn't do nothing. He didn't have a GPS. He got him an old flip phone. He didn't have a GPS on it. He got lost everywhere he went. He couldn't hardly work. He couldn't look up lumber prices or nothing. I said, why didn't you just keep the phone you had? He said, well, I just kept on having dirty stuff on it. I said, you know what? I said, I just kept my GPS and my board foot calculator. Mr. Debbie, I kept all the things I needed, and I just left off all that other. It ain't the smartphone's problem. Getting the flip phone don't make you sanctified. One man told me, he said, Internet's the problem, Brother Justin. We've got to get we got to preach that Internet out. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, since the genesis of Internet, sin has been rampant in America. And I said, well, there wasn't a Wi-Fi hotspot in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they done a pretty good job of being filthy, didn't they? I don't really think Internet is the whole problem. If you don't have enough of the grace of God to walk to Walmart and buy milk and eggs without buying liquor in the store in the cabinet next to it, you are the problem, not Walmart. Don't pray for Walmart to quit selling alcohol. Yes, it'd be great if they did. Just don't buy it. We went to go out and eat with some folks and they said, y'all would go to this restaurant, would you? I believe it's Olive Garden. And I said, uh, sure, yes, we go there. They said, they sell beer. And I said, I don't drink it. The people said, you mean you go places that sell alcohol? I said, do y'all shop at Walmart? They said, yes. I said, have you ever looked just down from the chocolate milk at what they're selling? They said, well, yeah, there's alcohol. I said, have you managed to get out of there without buying it? If a man ain't sanctified enough to have a cell phone and not sin, he can't go to Walmart and come out right. Amen, Brother Justin. If you can't buy a plane ticket on Priceline without hooking up with some center woman in Brazil and leaving your family for her, it's not the Internet's problem. It's your problem. Set your affections. Praise God. Well, let's stand this morning. I preached with this with you. It's kind of hard to get the feeling preachy about stuff like this, ain't it? But I felt like preaching to us this morning about setting our affections. There's things.